Good day, Grade 12 learners of South Africa. Welcome to Life Sciences with Mindset. Today we're going to be continuing with the whole environmental process and we're going to be looking at social organizations and human population and the impact of human population on all the little organisms on this planet. Okay, so just remember that as we go through this, you need to concentrate on the human impact and also on the way um, all structures and all communities are organized in some other form or manner. Now, you'll recall that last time we went through the different ways of determining population size. We had the direct method where you would do a census. You would actually count the, the number of organisms. So your teacher, for example, could do a census of the number of learners in her class. Um, all the teachers at, during the first period on a Monday morning count all the learners in their class and they send that to the office. The office could then say, right, we now know without a doubt that we have X number of learners in our school. All right, and that's based on a register and counting. That would be a census, it's direct. We have a census in South Africa approximately every five to eight years um, where the people come around and they check ah, how many people live in this house on this day and what, what are their earnings and how old are the different or the age groups of the different people. So that would be a direct method. An indirect method, you have to know sampling. Um, <clears throat> you also have to know the quadrant method Okay, um, so there we would determine the size of a population without counting. Um, why? Because you would take an average. The area would be too big. Let's say, for example, I said to you, um, I have this little copy on, on a huge piece of ground, let's say 10 kilometers, and I want you to tell me how many earthworms live there. So for heaven's sake, I can't go and count all the earthworms on in, in uh, over 10 kilometers. So what would you do? You would take a little portion and make sure that you select your quadrants, your squares, randomly. You'd make sure that you cover at least 10% of the total area. You would make sure that you are very accurate within the counting of each quadrant. And then you would get an average. And that would then tell you approximately what the number of organisms are there. And then your last uh, process that we looked at last time was your mark recapture mark method. Now, again, if you are in, for example, the Kruger National Park, um, the, the warders there and the game rangers there can't go around and count every single impala in the whole of the Kruger National Park. It's just too big. What they would do, though, is they use the mark recapture mark method. And when you use that method, <coughs> You catch a group of organisms, you put them in an enclosure, you mark them in some way that does not hurt them or damage them or make them easy prey, and you then release them. And after two or three weeks, you go, or a month, you go and you catch, those, catch another um, group, but of the same organisms, impala maybe, and you then count them. And within that group, you will have organisms that are marked and unmarked. And then you use a formula where you say the estimated population size is the number of organisms that were caught in the first catch times the number of organisms that were caught in the second catch divided by the number of marked organisms in the second catch. And that will then give you the number of approx... Or if, remember, this is an estimate. It's the approximate number of organisms that are in the game reserve, all right. And the more, more times you repeat this exercise, the mark recapture mark, the more accurate your results become. So that is how you would determine it. All right, so now we move on to human population, social organization, and the interactions in a community. Now remember, these interactions is what makes it an ecosystem because there is an interaction between the living so you'd have the biotic and the abiotic okay, factors in a community or in an ecosystem at least. Alrighty, here we go. Human population. Well, what do we do? 
We as humans populate this earth. We reduce the carrying capacity of the earth at an alarming rate due to what do we do? We pollute. We abuse the natural resources and we also use our fossil fuels. Now people, we are running out of fossil fuels at an at a alarming rate. And what we've done as human beings is we're trying to come up with solutions because that fossil, those fossil fuels that we are using and, and burning up to provide energy is polluting the air. So it would be a good thing actually if the fossil fuels ran out because it means that we could not then pollute at the rate that we are polluting. All right, and in grade um, 10 and 11, you've done a lot on pollution. So here, we need to look at human beings. We are the most numerous. We inhabit every corner of the earth. All right, and what do we do? We mess wherever we go, which is actually very sad. Okay, scientists theorize that with the exponential growth, now remember exponential growth is like that, of the human population, we also have a decline in the energy resources, and then more than that, we are, have a huge food shortage. We'll be faced with huge catastrophes by 2030. Um, and we can add to that the lack of water, because it doesn't appear as if people have a respect for water. And yes, I do sound like I'm part of Greenpeace, and I'm going green, and I'm all for the green planet, but people, um, I'm going to be dead by the time this nonsense happens. You are going to be around and it's up to your generation now to turn around and tell my generation and the generation before and after me, so much and no further, you're destroying our planet. We want some place for our kids to live. Okay, so we've got this exponential growth. We've got this decline in energy resources. All right, because we need lots of energy. Just think of all the things that you use electricity for. We have food shortages and we are heading for huge problems. Okay, now they say in 2005, research data of the UN states that more than five, uh, 855 million people were suffering from poverty and malnutrition in this world. Okay, that's a lot of people. Then we have Human population growth has serious implications on the natural environment because wherever we go, we destroy. As the human population increases, so does the demand for the ecological resources and the capacity of our planet to regenerate these resources to maintain a carrying capacity. Now, just to refresh your memories, a carrying capacity is the number of organisms that a specific area can accommodate comfortably. So, if we take a simple example, um, if I have a three-bedroomed house, that three-bedroomed house, I could quite easily accommodate six people. With a push, I can accommodate eight people. The minute I have more than that, we now have a problem. Okay, we're going to get in each other's way. We're not going to have enough bathrooms. We or there isn't, there won't, there are too many people using a bathroom. Um, the kitchen will be too small to cook for all those people, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I'm using a silly example, but that is it. If, I have, if I'm a farmer and um, I have a field, and in that field I have 100 cattle, those 100 cattle are going to eat all the grass. When it gets to a point that they've now trampled everything and eaten everything, they are going to starve unless I make another plan because they've now taken the carrying capacity, which was 100, they've now destroyed. And there is no longer a carrying capacity of 100 because of environmental resistance. So the environment says, no more. We can't accommodate you anymore. So the minute the carrying capacity is reached and exceeded, we then end up with environmental resistance, and that causes death. All right, the ecological footprint. People, you must know what the ecological footprint is. Um, I strongly suggest that you learn this because I believe you're going to get a nice little question on this. All right, so we have the ecological footprint. We call that the EF. Is the, now, you need to know this. This is your definition, okay? Is the measure of the demand of the human population on an ecosystem. 
Okay, our ecological footprint. We make footprints and we are not, it's, it's to measure how much we are taking from the ecosystem. So to go through it again, is the measure of the demand of the human population on the ecosystem. Now, you know, very often learners look at this section of work and they think, you know what, this is common sense. It is, but you have to know what parts of the common sense you can use in your questions and your, ex your exam and test questions. All right, now, the ecological footprint assesses the productive land and the marine area required to provide the human population with resources. Now, what do we need? We need food. We need living space. We also need energy, but we'll get to that. And also absorbs the waste. Now, from all our activities. Now, we all know that, that we are very, very wasteful and very, very few people actually recycle. And this is what we're trying to get people to do, is to recycle. Now, the ecological footprint is determined, uh, uh, is used to determine policy to regulate nations, educate people, and also alter their behavior to ensure that we don't mess up that carrying capacity, and to prevent overconsumption to ensure sustainability. Now remember people, sustainability means to be able to continue. If it is sustainable, we can continue. Now, the United Nations, shame, they work very hard at this, expects the world population to increase to about, now look at this, 9 billion by 2040. Based on these statistics, they reckon that the ecological footprint is increasing 1.3 times faster than the planet can renew its ecological resources. And you don't have to be Einstein to figure out if we are using our ecological resources faster than we can replace them, well, we are going to have a huge, huge problem. Here is a, a picture that I got um, from, it's a blog site, World Mysteries. And the mystery is that how so many people can actually fit into one small area. And this is it. This is what we're looking at. And the problem is when we get to a situation like this, people do not care. They basically fight to survive. Now, developing countries like the Western world, those are your first world countries, first world, okay? They produce a lot more food than their populations can, ex can, can consume. So they produce lots. So they're producing lots of food, okay? Which is great because what do they do? They then export it. So the food production rose 2.8% while the population only increased by 0.8%. So that's fine, that's, that's actually quite cool, they're okay. But look at this, in our developing countries like, guess what, Africa. Now remember, South Africa is regarded as a second world country. So we've sort of progressed from third world to second world country. But there are a lot of countries in, South, in Africa that are um, still very much third world countries. So. They're faced with food shortages, famines, droughts, the pressures of the environment, lack of technology, poor economics, lack of education. Um, and between 19, 1980 and 2000, food production rose by 1.4%, which is good. But look at this, people. The populations increased by 3.6%. So there is a huge shortage here. Um, countries are faced with three options. Okay, and you need to know these three options. Firstly, they can grow more food, right, so they can sustain their populations. They can reduce the population size, okay, or they can import food. But if they import food from other countries, what do they need? They need money. And very often, your third world countries um, don't have the money to import. So they rely on, on the world to give them things and donate things. Generally, those countries are in civil war. You take Ethiopia. They've been at civil war for years and years and years. So all of us donate. We see these pictures of poor little Ethiopian children. We think, oh my gosh. We then donate money. Um, food gets bought. Food gets taken there. And the warring armies 
steal most of it. And the people that it's intended for end up dying anyway. All right, so we have problems in this world and we need to work together to sort it out. If we look at the carrying capacity of a country must be increased or environmental resistance will cause an increase in mortality. In other words, the people will die and they will die of starvation. Developing countries often do not have economic structures and funds that the wealthy developed countries do. So in other words, we're talking about our second and third world countries here. And here we're talking about our first world countries. Feeding schemes and financial assistance are given, but they're not sustainable because eventually something must be paid back. All right, now, here we look at China. This is a, um, a population graph, which I took from Wikipedia. Um, it, it's of China in 2005, and it shows you the males versus the females. Um, and they've used, for every age group, they've used different colors. So if we look here from 0 to 4, there are far less children that were born in, or, or between the ages of 0 and 4 in China in 2005. Um, if you look here at your ages 15 to 19, there are more, but then it reduces again. And then you look here between 35 and 39, it's quite wide, but eventually it channels off. And looking here, be, your, your 90 to 94 year olds, there are still people around that, that are alive. And we're talking about millions of people here. So remember, always look at the number um, of units that you're using. So it's in millions across the bottom here. Exponential human population growth is a reality. And this is a problem. We are basically pushing all the animals and everything else and all the, and all the resources on the planet. We are pushing them all out. Why? Because we need to make place for humans. The world's natality rate, which is birth rate, is about 135 million per year. So 135 million new babies are born every year. This means that the world population number will be about 9 billion by 2040, which we've said already. Based on these statistics, scientists estimate that human ecological footprint is increasing 1.3 times faster than our resources. So here's some facts about the earth. 70.8% is covered in water. So we have a problem. Unless we are going to build cities underwater, um, we can't really use that. It, it's underwater. Us as humans, we, can't, we don't have gills. We can't breathe underwater. 7% is intact with natural plant and animals that are undisturbed. Only 7% of this planet, okay? 10% is under conversion to meet the needs of humans, and that includes deserts, all right? You just have to think of Dubai and what they've done to the desert there. 12% has been converted to agricultural lands. So remember, if we look at this, that leaves us with approximately plus minus. 30%, okay? Of that 30%, seven is intact, 10% is under conversion, 12% has been converted into agricultural lands, and 0.05 forms human habit habitats. So we, we only live on 0.05% of this entire planet, okay? But we destroy easily 80% of this planet on a daily basis. Human demands versus conservation. Okay, what do we do? We have the hunting industry. We have harvesting of natural resources, um, creation and management of game reserves. Now, th this harvesting of natural resources you dealt with in grade 10 and also in grade 11. Okay, where you, where, during the environmental section, you looked at what people do and how, if they are able to make money out of a resource, they end up abusing that resource. And we need to be careful because if we are going to abuse something, it's going to run out. We are going to deplete it. And these are words you will have to use if, for example, you are given an essay on this type of work. Okay, the hunting industry, well, th that is conservation to a degree. Um, and then we have creation and management of game reserves, which is cool because we have beautiful game reserves in this country. Okay, people, we're looking at question one here. It says, study the pyramid, all right? So it's a pyramid, let me get my blue pen, a pyramid of population size 
in Angola and answer the questions that follow. Now, if we look at this here, they give us the whole thing. This is a population census bureau, and the source was the United States Census Bureau. You've got naught to four years of age, males and females. There are one million kids. And then five to nine, there are just over 1.8, so say 1.85. And so we carry on for each age group, male and, uh, male and female. Now, if we look here, for example, more males make it to 80 plus. Um, but there are slightly more male children that are born as well, which is strange. It should be 50%, but it's just slightly more, so it is approximately 50%. But looking at this data here, we now have to look at our questions. So, what percentage of the female population is aged between 15 and 19 years? Show your calculations, and it says it gives us the information that the female population is 5.9 million. So if we go back to our graph here, we can't just go 5 to 19 and take a ruler and draw a line down here. So it's 0.6 percent of the females are going to be sitting here at 0.6 million. We have to say that it's 0.6 million, not of 1 million, but of all these amounts added together. And that, they said, gives us approximately 5.9 million. So it's 0.6. So the way we'll calculate this is we'll say, because remember, we must show all calculations. Um, 15 to 19 equals 0.6 million. OK? Now we've got to show all calculations. So the female population is 5.9 million. So we're going to say 0.6 divided by 5.9 or comma 9 is going to be equal to. So let's take our calculator, put our calculator on the side there. So we're going to say 0.6 divided by 5.9 equals. All right, and then we're going to say times 100 because we want to make it percentage is equal to, and our answer is approximately, we're going to round it off to 10 because it's 1, 6, 9, da, da. so it's still 1 is less than, than 5, so it'll be, and it's approximate, so it'll be 10, 10 percent. All right, so approximately 10% of the females are going to be between the age of 15 and 19 years of age. And for that, you would have got your mark here and your mark there. Okay, which age group makes up approximately 10% of the male population? And the total male population is 6 million. So all we have to do is go back to our, our graph and have a look, our pyramid at least, and have a look here. Now, which one is approximately, um, which male will be approximately 10%? It's 10% of 6 million, which, we, which, which would be 0.6, and it would be the males between 15 and 19 as well. And you'd put the years because you would get a mark for that. All right, so, and it's easy. All you have to do is look at 10% of 6 million would be 0.6, and you have a look at which group of males are 0.6. 1.3, what number of female population is aged between 65 and 69? Show your calculations. All right, people, so what we'll do is we look at 65 to 69 females. You take your ruler, and you draw a line all the way down here. Just make sure it's straight. Remember, I'm doing it freehand. So it ends up being approximately halfway between 0.0 and 0.2, which makes it 0.1. So we're going to say, right, it's approximately 0.1, and it's 0.1 of, in, in millions. So that would be approximately 100,000 females. All right, and having said that, they're going to give you two marks for it. Okay. Now, what is the difference in population size between females in the age group of 0.4 and 45 to 49? So 0.4 and 45 to 49. So again, we're looking at the females. So 0.4 
0 to 4 years is 1.0. And we're looking at 45 to 49. This will be approximately 0 0.2. Uh, um, yeah, 0.2. So now we need to add them together. So we go 0 to 4 was 1.0. And 45 to 49 was uh, 0.2, if I remember. All right, so now we need to know, they want to know the difference in population size. Difference always means minus. So how are we going to do this? We're going to say 1.0 minus 0.2 is going to give me 0.8. Okay, now remember it's in millions, so the answer here is going to be 800,000 females. And what they'll do here is they'll give you a mark for that, and they give you a mark for this. And there is your two. Okay, provide two reasons why mortality rate is so high for the age 0 to 4. Now if you look at this mortality rate, it is very high, okay, um, in, in this group because from 0 to 4 and then the children that are 5 to 9, a whole bunch have died. You've got probably, that's 0 0.8, 0 0.85 I would put it at. So 0 0.9 would be here. So it's about halfway, so I'd say 0 0.85. So we've lost a whole bunch of, of children there. We've lost another group of children there. So there are a lot of kids that are dying. And what would cause that death? Remember, these are China, you've got a very large amount of people that die and don't make it to old age. All right, they've got an incredible population. So it would be, for example, disease. Okay, the little ones die of diseases. They can die of malnutrition. Okay, what else would kill them? Um, civil war. What else would kill children? Um, lack of health care. Um, lack of education of parents. Poverty. Um, any here, you had to give two reasons. It would have been any of these would have given you two marks. All right. Now, which group, male or female, has the greater percentage reaching old age? It's very simple. You just simply look at this and you look at which one is going to have more. Which group reaches old Which where do you have more reaching old age? Now, look at the colors here. Um, and I mean, if you were given this in an exam, it'll be in black and white. So you'll get different colors of different shades of black and white. But clearly there are more in the 80 plus males than females. Um, between 75 and 79, I would say the males have slightly more. And here it's about the same. And here it's about the same. So as we go up, but it's, if you look at the really old age, it's going to be the males. They clearly don't have as much stress as the women do. Okay, people, question 1.7. Provide two reasons for your answer in 1.6 above. Now, males, why? How come they live longer and females don't? Well, first of all, females are going to have, so we can say here, um, let's do it like this, say females live um, for less years or live a shorter lifespan, etc. Why? Because, number one, they have more stress. Number two, um, they are exposed to children's illnesses. Okay, so every time the kids get sick, the moms are the ones that are there. 
All right, number three, malnutrition. Because remember, the men go off. They go and work wherever they're working, and they, they don't live with their families most of the time. The women are stuck with the kids. They have more stress. They have to, they have, they're malnourished. Um, they have very poor health care. So if the dads are, um, have gone to work in the mines or wherever they are working, they'll get very good medical care and medical attention. Here there's, no, there's very little health care in the rural areas, very poor living conditions. Okay, um, and then remember the women work the fields. They're the ones that grow the food and clean and cook and do everything, so they work hard physically. Not to say that the men don't, but you must remember the women are working physically um, and they're working very basic care and they're malnourished is probably the most important one and they're exposed to children's illnesses. So here I've given you six. They wanted any two reasons and you would have got two marks for each of them. Okay, now we look at social organization. And social organization, we have social organization. Um, as human beings, you've got um, the people that have and the people that don't, the people that are in charge and the people that aren't. Um, you've got the bosses and you've got the workers. We are exactly the same, except that we are not possibly as organized as the animal world. So let's have a look at our animal world. Okay, social organizations, what does it mean? It describes the role, the function, and the status within a population to ensure survival of the whole group. And this is why what they say makes us as human beings human. Um, and that we'll cover when we get to the section on diversity. Um, we are special, and this is how humans developed, and why we are different from the Neanderthals, for example, is that they had, we learned to speak, and communicate, and we had a very, very set social structure. Um, although I don't know about clubbing someone over the head and carrying them off, whether that is a social structure, but that is what we have here. Okay, so we're talking about this social structure. There's a role, there's a function, and there's a status, and that is what makes a social organization. Okay, um, examples. Um, of various social organizations where the whole community benefits. Now, if we look at the animal herds, um, they are, there's a collective animal behavior. These animals work together. And in doing that, they provide protection against predators. Now, if we look at the elephants, for example, the oldest female is called the matriarch. Matriarch coming from maternal, coming from female, all right? And she's the oldest female, and she leads the herd. She is in charge of the herd. The males will protect the herd, but the old female, the matriarch, is the one that actually makes sure that that entire population has its, or uh, that it survives. Um, and she's the most dominant and basically leads the herd. If we look at um, bird flocks, oh, just by the way, let's just go back to the animals here. Um, the, this collective animal behavior and this protection, what they do is they, they run as a herd. They will move as a herd. They will graze as a herd. And you'll have your dominant males, and they will make sure that the females and the babies are taken care of and that they're within the group. And when, for example, your predators hunt them, um, they will start to run, but they run as a collective. And your weaker ones... Um, and your slower ones will be on the periphery and at the back, and they're the ones that get caught. So it helps with survival of the fittest. If you aren't fit enough, it's not going to work. And what the lions very often do, as well as cheetahs, is they will go f they'll try and single out a baby from the herd, and the herd will continue to move. It's not going to stop for one baby that's being left behind, and that then becomes an easy catch. Okay, people, now we look at bird flocks, all right? Now, what do they do? Again, it's collective animal behavior, and it's very similar to herds. Now, something that's really beautiful to watch is geese that fly in a V-shape. And in that V-shape, they're actually looking after each other. 
um, because it assists with wind resistance. So you've got your strongest goose will start at the head, okay? And then as he gets tired, he goes to the back and they all sort of move up one or they'll move up one from this side. So they all get a chance of being at the head and f facing the most wind resistance, okay? But they also get a chance to rest and the rest of the flock gives them that chance to do so. It's very much like cyclists. You know, when they cycle in a group and they, they sort of, um, working on wind resistance, so the guy behind hasn't got as much wind resistance as the guy in front. Um, and it's, it's based on this principle of the geese flying. So when the leader gets tired, he moves out of the point to the end and he's replaced by a fresher bird. And what does this do? It also, with the flock, provides protection against predators. But more than anything, it helps the whole flock to move forward faster. Okay, animal packs. Now, animal packs are incredible because what we've got here is they, if they're hunting packs like your wolves, like your wild dogs, um, they are far more successful than one or two working together. Here you've got a whole pack and they are very, very successful hunters. Also, very protective of their offspring. Okay, very. Um, and you've got your packs have smaller numbers than herds, and there's always a ranking order. Now that ranking order is based on the alpha male. And the alpha male will pick a female and they will become the dominant breeding pair. Okay, and that dominant breeding pair, this male, is the one that actually does it all. Now for those of you that have animals, and especially dogs, and you've ever watched a guy called Caesar, and he's called the dog whisperer. And he always talks about pack. And if you have two or three dogs, you are or you must be the pack leader. And if you're the pack leader, you can actually train your animals properly um, and they will listen to you. But if they don't have respect for you as the pack leader, well, then your animals do whatever they want and they become uncontrollable. So this is all about training pack. And here you've got your alpha male. He'll pick the alpha female. Alpha female. He picks the alpha female and they become the dominant breeding pair. Okay. Good genes. This is survival of the fittest. Now, when the pack members are of a certain age, they move to a new territory. Now, remember, all your pack animals are very territorial. They'll mark out, this is my territory, and that's it. You do not come into my territory. And then they start their own family unit. Now, there's no sexual tension in the packs because the leadership of the alpha male is accepted. He's always the most dominant. aggressive, he's the strongest, and that's good because that means those strong genes are passed on to the next generation. The dominant breeding pair leads the pack, and with their signals and their behavior, that's imitated by the young members into hunting strategies. Your disadvantage of working as a pack is that all the members share the food, and this means that the Eating, there's an eating order. Your strongest males eat first, then the females, and then the babies, and then only the weak, okay, get whatever's left on the carcass. And then, of course, you've got your vultures that also come around and challenge the weak ones and the babies. But at the end of the day, if you've ever seen a, li um, a, um, a lion pack hunting, the males always eat first, then the female. I mean, the females do the kill, and the males come and they eat. Then the females eat, then the babies eat. Okay, now we look at our insect colonies. Now, here we, we're looking specifically at the bees, but your termites behave in the same way, your ant colonies, um, insects work like this. So what do we have? We have three castes in the bee colony or social group. Now, here we call them castes, all right? But it's actually just social groups. We have a queen, and what does the queen do? Her biggest job is to lay eggs. That's all. She lays every single one of the eggs in that beehive. The queen is a larva, 
and she develops from a fertilized, now this is important, a fertilized egg, and she's fed on very nutritious stuff called royal jelly. Now what they've also done is um, for women that are pregnant, they give them um, royal jelly. They're capsules, they've got royal jelly and a whole bunch of vitamins and minerals and it's supposed to be good for the developing baby. Now the first mature female a queen that, that emerges, what does she do? Her first thing, because she's got a sting, is she goes and she kills all the other possible queens. Okay, so now she's got no competition. She does away with her competition. Then she leaves the hive for her nuptial or her mating flight. Now, nuptial means it's, it's, it's like getting married. It's, you have your nuptial rights and, um, you know, you commit to another person. They are your nuptials. Well, here her nuptial is to go out and she mates with a drone. So that's her mating flight. And then after mating, she goes back to the hive and she lays eggs, boy. And does she lay eggs? Millions and millions and millions of them, okay, in her lifespan. So she lays up to 3,000 eggs per day for her lifespan of four years. Now you go calculate, four times 365 times 3,000, a lot of eggs. Okay, there's your queen bee larva. This has just been cut out of a, um, a section of a honeycomb. And you've got your queen bees there, their little larvas. Now this one's clearly bigger than this one. So she's probably going to hatch before this one. She'll sting this little larva. Okay, queen bee and her helpers. Here's our queen bee. This is clearly before she's now got ready to mate um, because other, her, her abdomen here is not large enough. But here you've got all the little helpers and they're checking her out and making sure that she's okay. Now we get to the drones. The drones are your second cast. Remember your first cast is the queen. Second cast is drones. And these are your fertile males, okay? But look at this, they develop from unfertilized eggs, whereas the female, where the queen developed from um, fertilized eggs, your drone is an, is an unfertilized egg. And the process here is called parthenogenesis. It's very much the same as if it's, unfert it, it's unfertilized, it's unsexed. Okay, the drones cannot feed themselves, so the little worker bees must feed them. They are useless. They literally are created purely to mate. The drone has no sting. He can't feed himself. His sole purpose in life is to mate with that queen so that she can lay a whole bunch of eggs. That's it. All right, so this poor drone, it's a fertile male, unfertilized egg, and no sting, shame. He can't even protect himself. He can't feed himself. He, that his only job is to mate with a queen. And after mating, part of the drone's gut is ripped out when he tries to fly away from the queen. And that is what results in death. I mean, not very pleasant. So guys out there, be grateful you humans are not a drone. All right. There's your drone. You can see he has no sting. His only job is to mate, um, and yeah, that's about it. He's your fertile male. And now the little worker bees. This is cast three. And the little worker bees are the smallest physically. They're not as big as the queen. She's got to lay eggs. The drone's job is to mate with the female, okay, I mean with the queen. Now, these are all sterile little females, and they develop from fertilized eggs, which is different to the drone. Now, people, you can be asked to compare the three castes. And one of the comparisons is the fact that whether they fertilized or unfertilized eggs. The first three weeks of hatching, they develop into an adult worker. Now, they live for only six weeks and they perform functions inside the hive for the first three weeks and outside the hive for the next three weeks. Shame. The role and function of the worker bees is as follows. Okay. When they're inside the hive, they're going to nurse the bees. All right, that's the first 12 days. So they clean out the cones, the little cone cells. They feed the drones that can't feed themselves. They feed the larvae that are going to develop into queens. Okay. Um, the, uh, then you've got those are the little nurse bees. Their job is just to make sure that everyone is fed and everything is nicely cleaned. Then you've got the cleaner and builder bees. 
okay, the next six days, they clean the hive. Remember, these guys empty out the cells. These guys clean the hive. They produce wax to build the new cell, cells, and they convert nectar into honey. So what are they doing? Here they're providing food. All right, those are the clean and builders. And then we get the guardians. And the guardians are for the next three days. So they only guard for three days. And they make sure that that entrance to the hive is completely protected. Also, and, and I've actually seen this, is um, when there's a felt fire and there's a beehive, the bees, these guardians, b uh, um, flap their wings at the entrance to the hive. And they flap their wings and they flap their wings like crazy. Why? Because they regulate the temperature inside the hive and they try and keep the hive cool even though there's a fire range, raging. And you feel so sorry for them because eventually the whole hive just melts and breaks up. Okay, but they use their wings for fanning and regulating the temperature. So they protect and regulate the temperature in, in the hive. All right, people, then we get to the field bee. And the field bee, shame, this is for the second set of, of three weeks that this poor little thing lives for, li uh, the, the time it lives for, searching, gathering, and processing food. And after this, shame, she literally dies of overwork. Um, so in comparison to the drone, she's got a sting, he doesn't. She works her heart out for six weeks, he just goes out, mates with the queen, and then dies. So... After six weeks of working, this poor little thing dies. No, she has a sting. And if she's threatened in any way or her hive is threatened in any way, a bee will sting you. If you get a bee sting, remember that the, the bee's dead. It dies because the sting, when the sting goes in, it's got barbs, so it stays in your skin, and it rips out of the back of this, the abdomen. So it rips out like half of its intestines as well. So the bee dies. Never ever take the, the, the sting and pull it out because when you pull it like that and you put pressure on it, you squeeze all the poison into your hand so, or, or wherever it stung you. So take something that's really sharp, even a fingernail or a, a sharp knife or, and you, or a credit card, you know, any kind of plastic thing, and you just scoop it sideways and you then scoop it out and less poison will then go into the person. And by the way, the, the swelling and the itching and the soreness of a, a bee sting is your body reacting to the poison of the sting. Okay, vinegar also works, by the way, just good old vinegar. Here we've got our little worker bees, sham. And these here will be the nurse bees because what are they doing? They're busy fixing everything and making sure that everything is perfect and nice and clean and the cells are all nice and clean. And then you'll have a couple of bees here that, that will be the uh, builder uh, bees because why? They are busy putting honey into that. Okay, question two. Study the diagram of the three castes. Remember, those are your social groups of, of individual bees that live in a bee colony and answer the questions that follow. So let's have a look. What do we have here? There's our little worker bee. And here is the drone. And here is the queen with her big fat abdomen. Something else you'll know with the drone is the drone always has very large eyes. So if they ever ask you to identify the diagrams, he's slightly bigger than the worker, but not, hasn't got the same sized abdomen as the female, and he has very, very large eyes. All right, people, let's identify the casts. Remember, casts are your three social groups marked as A, B, C. Well, I remember that A was our worker, and B was our drone, why? He had larger eyes and a small abdomen, and he was bigger than the worker. And C is definitely our queen. Why? Huge, big, fat abdomen. Okay, so now to the functions. We have to give one function of each, and we'll say, right, the worker bee, well, what does the worker bee do? You could have put any one of the three, but they, they clean, they protect, and they feed the larva. Okay, that's what they do. They clean everything, they protect everything, they feed those babies, they're the nursemaids, etc., etc. The drones to mate with the queen. With the queen. And the queen, oh, well, she just lays eggs. 
That's her job. All right, so there we've got our functions. Which one of the three casts has no sting? Well, you should know by now that the poor drone has no sting and he was B. Okay, boops. Then, how does the queen bee ensure that only one queen bee develops to the stage of laying eggs is as soon as she hatches, so we get the first queen to hatch, will sting all the other larva to death. Okay, she kills them all. Whoever gets out of that, that um, little cell first, she just kills the whole lot. Okay, name the special substance that is fed only to the queen bee. It is royal jelly. Now, if I was setting a question on casts, I, could, I would, for example, say tabulate the difference between um, a social grouping of a herd, social grouping of a pack, social grouping of insects, okay, specifically bees. Um, you could be asked to do a comparison between the drone, the worker bee, and the queen. Um, they are going to ask you something on social um, organization. Please be ready for a question on it. Okay, now interactions in a community. Now remember, what is a community? A community is different species that live in the same area, okay, that are able to interact. All right, they interact with each other. Whereas a population was the same species that live in the same area that interbreed. Community is different species living in the same area and they interact. So the example that we went through earlier in the previous session was that um, you'd have an impala buck would, be, would need the grass. So it, is, it needs the grass, and your lions need the impala. Indirectly, the lion needs the grass. So it's whether it's direct or indirect, there is an interaction. Okay? Survival of a species depends on maintaining the population numbers. If those numbers are too high, you're going to impact on the carrying capacity and cause environmental resistance. Okay, so it's very important that those population numbers remain constant. Okay, various relationships occur between different species. Um, when they cohabit, means they live together in a specific environment. Now, we've got a term called symbiosis that you must know. And symbiosis means to live together. People, what I've done is in your X sheets, I've actually put definitions um, in the beginning of every set so that and th make sure you know those definitions now clearly those definitions are used within the, the the summary set that you get but those definitions are important because they can ask you in multi choices they can ask you and provide the term for column a and column b and also in long questions they'll say to you what is the difference between a and b and those are definitions you need to know. But symbiosis means living together. So in any ecosystem, your organisms are either directly or indirectly dependent, like, for example, the lions and the impalas and the grass that I've just used now. Scientific evidence proves that symbiotic organisms have adapted and evolved in response to each other within a community. They respond to each other. And they've also proved that with regards to evolution and organisms changing over time, um, your bees evolved as your angiosperm or your flowering plants evolved. So there is proof um, when we look at fossils, how different organisms developed. Okay, and the interaction with each other, they co-evolved. All right, now within a community, there are your producers, they're your consumers, and your decomposers. So now let's look at what is a producer? It's all plants that are autotrophic. Okay? In other words, autotrophic, they can produce their own food. Your consumers eat the plants. Okay, but now they've got three groups of consumers. You've got your primary consumers, 
they're normally herbivores. Come on, you know this from grade eight and grade nine, okay? Then you've got your secondary consumers, and those are normally your carnivores. And then you have your tertiary consumers, which are either carnivores, or they can be omnivores. Now remember, herbivores only eat plants, carnivores eat meat, and carnivores uh, as tertiary will eat the meat, so they'll eat the secondary carnivores and uh, secondary consumers, and your omnivores eat plants and meat, okay, flesh. And then your decomposers. Now without the decomposers, you don't put back into the earth what has been used. So your decomposers form an exceptionally important role in the ecosystem. What I've done here is, is it's a, um, a sort of a schematic representation. If we have a population increase, all right, from the equilibrium, so you've got the equilibrium is reached and your carrying capacity is within its limits, so everything's perfect. Now the population increases, that you immediately have an increased environmental resistance and therefore increased competition because the environment doesn't have a, a lot left. So it means that your organisms are going to compete for food, okay? For food, shelter, space, mates, the competition gets more because remember we're talking about a population. Now what happens then is with that competition, organisms are going to die and we then have a negative feedback which is going to cause a decrease in the population and the population numbers return within that carrying capacity and that gives you your equilibrium. So it's going to do this. Okay, if the population decreases from normal, so the carrying capacity is now at its limit, we have a decrease in the environmental resistance, so there isn't as much. There is less competition, which now gives the population a time to increase, and we get back to our equilibrium. So this is the result of the whole process. Okay, Population increases, and we're going to have environmental resistance and competition, which will make it come down. And then it'll go up come down, go up and come down. And that gives you almost like a homeostasis within the ecosystem. Selection and survival. Okay, this is quite important. We have selection as a process where organisms survive and others do not. Why are some selected and others aren't? Okay, now it's going to depend on physically and behaviorally better suited to an environment. And if they are physically better suited and their behavior is better suited, they're going to have a better chance to survive. And if they survive, they will then reproduce. Okay, the good characteristics are then passed on to the ne next generation and everybody sings Kumbaya. The population increases and everything is perfect until the environment reaches its carry or, or the, yeah, the environment reaches its carrying capacity. Okay, now, when that carrying capacity is reached, it starts to put pressure on the environment and that will then cause environmental resistance. Now, I, I hope this makes sense because just understand, if I have mm, a dozen eggs, okay, for this week. I've gone and I've done my shopping and in our home we have a dozen eggs. We can eat one egg a day, we can eat half an egg a day and make it last longer. But if we eat all those eggs in one shot, when those eggs are finished, they're finished. And we've got to wait then until we go and do shopping again. So that would be a form of environmental resistance. We won't be able to eat eggs. So we'd have to find something else to eat. And that's what happens in nature. Remember, they, don't, they can't go to the shops and buy. But that's what happens. If we have this population increasing, it gets to a carrying capacity. How many organisms can comfortably live in that area? When that gets surpassed and there are more than can comfortably live in that area, the environment starts to resist and it says, hold on. I don't have enough water, I don't have enough space, I don't have enough food for all of you guys. And what happens? Some of them will die. 
Some of them will emigrate and leave, but the population will decrease so that we get back to the carrying capacity. You've got to know people, carrying capacity, you have to know environmental resistance and how these two interact. The result is the increase in intraspecific and interspecific competition. Now, you look at these words, you think, oh my goodness, I don't know what this means. It's easy. Intra means inside. Inter always means between. So if it's inside specific competition, it means it is inside the population. Okay, it's inside that specific population. Now, what will the organisms in one population compete for? Intra-specifically, for food, for shelter, for water, for mates. They will compete with each other. So if I have a whole bunch of penguins, they are going to compete for a little bit of space to put their little nest. They're going to compete for their mates. They're going to compete for food. Okay, and they live where there's a hell of a lot of water, so that won't be a problem. Okay, interspecific would be between different species. Okay, different species. Now, the organisms that are stronger clearly are going to succeed in keeping the resources they need. Okay, and that means they can survive to reproduce. And that means that they will be genetically strong and stable. So it all revolves around survival of the fittest. If the population increases, so the number of parasites and predators are going to increase. Now that's important because <clears throat> if you have, if I've got sheep and I'm a sheep farmer and I have a hundred sheep, well that's fine. One of them gets sick, I take that one sheep, whether it's got a parasite, whether whatever, I take that one sheep and I go and I fix it, I take it away. But if I've got a thousand sheep, the chances of me picking up that one of them is sick is going to be very, very low. And by the time I know what's going on, I've got a hundred sheep that are all sick. And the minute they are a hundred that are sick, they, that disease just spreads so quickly. So the more organisms you have in a, in, in a specific area, the quicker disease and parasites are going to spread. Now, <clears throat> predators. If I have one cat and one mouse, like Tom and Jerry, does the cat ever catch the mouse? No. Okay, and it doesn't only happen in cartoons. I I'm talking real life. It's very difficult for that one cat to catch that one mouse. But if there are a hundred mice running around, that cat, the chances of the cat catching a mouse every day is outstanding because there are just so many of them, you can pick and choose which one he wants to eat. So predation depends on numbers, okay? It is a density dependent perimeter, which we did in the last session. So very important people, your parasites, which is disease, and your predators. Now, the predators will have an increase in available food. The parasites and diseases spread easily because there are large populations causing a decrease in numbers. Okay, predation people is the interaction, and you must know this, it is the definition. Interaction between the predator and the prey in a specific territory. Now clearly you need a specific territory. Your cat at home, and I hope you don't have mice, but if you did have mice, that would be the cat's territory, okay? If we look at the Kruger National Park, um, a specific area where a pride of lions has made their home, that is their territory. And it's only the prey that comes into their territory that's going to be a problem, or it's gonna be a problem for the prey. Okay, so they are territorial. This is my territory. The predators are carnivores, okay, so remember they're consumers, they are secondary or tertiary consumers, and they hunt and kill and eat prey. That is the, what a predator does. A predator hunts, a predator kills a live organism, and then eats that organism, all right? The prey is generally herbivore, 
Okay, so there is no competition that exists between the predator and the prey. Okay, the prey is certainly not going to eat what the predator eats because the predator eats them. So, and I know this sounds like it's logical, but you've got to understand that your predator eats the prey. You're always going to have a lot more prey than you are going to have a predator. Go back and think about your cat and the mice. Okay, your cat, one cat. 100 mice or 50 mice. Otherwise, the cat is going to run out of food. If there are really lots of mice, well, the cat can say to his buddies, listen, guys, come here. Come check out here. We've got lots and lots and lots of mice here. We've got food for the next five years. Okay? So there is never any competition between the prey and the predator. Predators assist with the survival of the fittest, and this is exceptionally important, by regulating populations naturally. That's what the predator does. Now, we've seen case studies where they've taken the predator out of um, an area, um, or you have these little game farms that start up because they decide that they want to have impala and a couple of spring buck and a couple of little dacres and they put all these buck in this place and those buck just carry on breeding because there's nothing eating them um, the minute you introduce a predator you bring down the whole process and you make sure that everything functions within the balance of the carrying capacity of the area so predators regulate populations naturally the weakest of the prey are caught and eaten. The survival of the predator depends directly on the number of prey that are available. And these numbers will change. As the predator eats these organisms, so they will change constantly. When the prey population numbers are large, the carrying capacity of the environment is raised for the predator. There is, this results in an increase in the predator population. Why? Because there's plenty of food. You've raised the carrying capacity. Now, as the prey population decreases, what am I doing? I'm taking the food away. So it's going to cause a decrease in the carrying capacity. Why? There's less food available, which indirectly will cause a decrease in the population of the predators. The carrying capacity of the environment decreases, the predator population can't be supported, so they either starve or they emigrate. Remember, emigrate is to exit. Emigrate with an I means to come into the area, and it's permanent. Predators keep the population of the prey close to the carrying capacity in a, now this is important, a cyclic fluctuation. In other words, it's a cycle that changes. This means that the prey population increases and decreases in a cycle and the predator populations respond. A healthy, stable population results um, for both the predator and the prey, and this is called a self-regulation process within that ecosystem. And we go back here where we said that the carrying capacity of that environment will decrease so that the predator population has to now leave. When the, when the prey increases, here, yeah, then the predator population will also increase. It always lags a little bit behind. And this process of self-regulation, or natural self-regulation, ensures self-sustainability of an, of an environment. Then along come the human beings. And what do we do? We mess it up because we either take a whole bunch of the, of the animals that the predator is eating and we give them to someone else. We sell them or we bring in hunters and we kill them because we make more money from a hunter than we do from just having a stable environment. Okay, here's a predator-prey graph and you are going to get a question on predator prey in an exam. I will put money on it that you will get it. So here we go. This is your x-axis and on the x-axis is time. On your y-axis, you're going to have the population size. So it'll be the population of the population of whatever. It's the population size always. Now what we've got here is your prey 
there are always more animals and you must remember that. And your predator, always fewer animals. You're never ever going to have as many predators as you have prey because the minute that happens, your, prey are go your predators are going to die. So as, and this is why we said it is cyclic, okay, number one, and number two, your predator always follows the prey. It's always a little bit behind. So we start off with our prey population. As it increases, so the predator population increases. It's like, think of a jackal, jackal or, or fox will say to his mates, hey, listen, guys, there's a whole bunch of rabbits here. Come, it's fun. Come and eat with me and come and hunt with me. And off they go and they hunt. The rabbit population decreases and the, and the foxes turn around and say, okay, guys, we, we're sort of running out of food here. Um, you know what, you need to actually move on a bit. And when, when the population or the rabbit, when the food gets more, I'll let you all know. And that is basically what happens in nature. We self-regulate. Here I've got a lovely picture of, um, this is clearly a buffalo, and um, you've got your, your daddy lion there, and here's a little cub that's just sort of come to eat a little bit as well. But you can see this, this buffalo has been well eaten. Okay, now when the predators are removed from an area, the prey population explodes because there's nothing to naturally control it and there's no longer a naturally st stabilizing factor. What happens? Overgrazing. We have severe damage to the habitat. And what does that result in? The environment will say, uh-uh, so far no more. So the environment will resist, and we then end up with a decrease in that carrying capacity. As I said, you must understand your environmental resistance and the way it works in conjunction with your carrying capacity. Population will crash, okay? And what's gonna happen? They're gonna be starving and, and they're gonna be dying of disease. Now we look at this question here. We've got the dussies and the lynxes. So the dussies, and I'm going to do this in a color. So let's pick a nice bright color. We'll do the dussies in yellow so you can see it nicely. There's the dussy population, and let's do the lynxes we're going to do in green. Now you can clearly see that your lynx is going to be, your lynx is your predator. And look at what I'm doing here. I'm writing on my question before I've even looked, or, or the graph, before I've even looked at the questions. That's my predator, this is my prey, okay? Prey numbers are always more than the predator, except here there's a little bit of an overlap, which is a big mess, and then it comes up. So this is gonna create huge issues within the environment, okay? and major starvation and decrease in population size of the lynxes. This is taken from 1991 to 1997, so it's only over a six year period. And the, there are population, maximum dussies are 600, maximum predator are 400, okay? Something else, if we look here, the, the dussie population increases to 600 and then drops to about 380, I would say and then goes back up here to 500, which means your carrying capacity is approximately here. For the, du uh, for the dussies, I can't draw straight. For the dussies is about there, and then for your lynxes, well, I would say put that at about 300. Okay, so let's look at our questions. How many dussies and lynxes were there in 1995? Now this is easy. You go to your graph, you never ever read anything from a graph without a ruler, okay? So we have a look, 1995, how many dussies were there? There were 500. Oh, sorry, how many dussies and lynxes? All right, your dussies, there were 500, and your lynxes, approximately, I would say 200, yeah. So it's at that point there, so they're 200. 
and bumps, bumps, and then you've got two marks, just from being able to look on a graph. Okay, then we look at question 2.3. In what year was the population of the Dussies the highest? So, Dussies highest was in 1993. Another easy mark. In what year was the population of lynxes the highest? Uh, 1994. In which year did the population of Dussies start decreasing? Give a reason for your answer. So we need to look at which year the Dussies were decreasing. So they go up in 1993 to 600, okay? And then they start to decrease. Look at this. And they decrease all the way to 1994. What happened here? Well, clearly, they had predators increasing, okay? So it was 1993, so let's go back to our answer here. In which year? It was 1993, and that will give you a mark. And why? Um, the number of predators increased. And the minute you have an increase in the number of predators, you're going to have a decrease in the number of prey. Okay, in which year did the population of lynxes start decreasing? Okay, and give a reason for your answer. So when, look here, when did the lynxes start to decrease? Now they reach a peak in 1994 and they also start decreasing in 1994. And why? Well, there's a decrease here in the population of dussies in the area. And therefore there was less food. So it was 1994 and why? We have a decrease in dussies. So therefore, there is a decrease in food, okay? And if there's a decrease in food, that therefore will result in a decrease in predators. Now, please don't use this in an exam. I mean, I'm trying to get to this quickly, but there's a decrease, a decrease, and a decrease, okay? Study the graph and explain the relationship between the population of the dussies and the lynxes as a survival strategy. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to explain it to you here on the graph. So if we look at this graph here, what have we got? As the population of dussies increases, okay, so here we're going to have an increase. As the population of the dussies increases, the lynx, lynx population increases. Okay, that's two marks. All right, now, what do the lynxes do? The lynxes prey on the dussies, and that will give you another mark. So they are the predators, and they will eat the prey. So there's another mark, okay? And what are they doing? They regulate, they regulate the dussy population. And that's another mark. So we need, that was out of five, so we've already got four marks. And then we say, when the population of the dussies decreases, what are we going to find? We're going to find a decrease in the population of the lynxes. And that's another mark there. So what they'll do is they'll say, any five of those points will give you five marks. All right, people, we now look at predation in, South, in the South African context. Okay, several years ago, we had a snake population in Fredenburg. And the reason we're doing this is you have to, in the exams, be able to have, know two examples. So this is one of the examples. And this was in Fredenburg district in the Western Cape. And this is why, okay? There was lots of wheat, okay? Now remember, wheat is the producer. In, in, an, in an ecosystem. The area is exceptionally good. This attracted mice. Mice are your primary consumers. Okay? And why? That lots of wheat is produced. That wheat <coughs> becomes a food source for our little mice. The increase in the mice and rat population extends to the next level of the food chain, namely snakes. Now the snakes, remember, are predators in this case. 
The increase in the snake population, look at this, resulted in an increase in the secretary birds and other snake eaters in the environment. And what did we have? We have a self-regulation in the ecosystem because the rats ate the wheat, the snakes ate the rats, the secretary birds ate the snakes. So they actually regulate to keep the rat population down and to keep the snake population down. There's an example. No. So we have more, rat, more wheat, more rats, more snakes, more secretary birds. And this is the important thing here. It's self-regulation in an ecosystem. Okay, ne next example. <clears throat> in 1998, there's an outbreak of disease that killed the jackrabbit population in the Kimberley area. Now, the jackrabbit is a, a rabbit that has, um, it's a family or species of rabbit that has very long legs. Okay, they, that's why they call them a jackrabbit, because they can jump around like a jumping jack. And that's honest. It's not, I haven't sucked that out of my thumb. That's real. Okay, the black-backed jackal feeds on these little rabbits. Now, there is your predator. Okay, and the rabbits would be the prey. So that little food was available and they began attacking the livestock because what must they do? They live in this area, that's their territory. There aren't enough rab uh, um, rabbits, jackrabbits, so what do they do? They look for food and the food would be the livestock. The farmers then decided this is nonsense. They suffered huge losses and they declared the back-backed jackal a pest. So what do they do? They start hunting these poor animals and they kill them at a rapid rate. This allowed the rabbit population to increase. Why? Because there was nothing eating them. Okay, because of the lack of predators. And we now have a regulating mechanism as human beings stepped in. The increasing populations of the rabbits then become uncontrollable. Okay, and they destroy huge amounts of crops. So with the increase in the available prey, the black-backed j jackal now starts to eat those rabbits and that increases. And by 2007, both populations stabilized in a self-regulating stability now exists. Okay, so less jackrabbits, less food for the jackals. The jackals eat the livestock. The farmers hunt the jackals. You have a decrease in the jackal population, which allows the jackrabbit population to increase increase in the jackal population because now that clearly when there are so many rabbits what happens the farmers stop killing the jackals and we then have an increase in the jackal population and we again end up with self-regulation in the ecosystem and we end up with two stable populations okay people so this self-regulation in an ecosystem will lead to a, a stable population now what i really want you to understand is if we have a population, and we have population B, and both of these populations live within a specific area, so we've got this lovely big area. Within this area, we have water. We have shelter, space, because remember, it's not just shelter, it's space to move around, and food. This would be determined by the environment, okay? The environment has a specific carrying capacity. So it is the carrying, carrying capacity of the environment. Now, within this carrying capacity, we can possibly say we can have 50 of these organisms and 10 of these organisms. The minute I do that, you should immediately be able to pick up that population A, these are my prey, and population B is my predator. And they live in this wonderful, beautiful area. This is the predator's territory. This is where they live. Within there, we are going to have our prey. Now, that carrying capacity 
stable population would be 50, stable population would be 10. The minute the population increases above 50, our predator population is going to increase above 10. And then we are going to have a stabilizing effect. And that is going to cause the prey population to decrease below 50, and the predator population will follow by decreasing to below 10. And everything works as a negative feedback. Now remember, when we have a negative feedback, when there is an increase, you end up with stabilizing and it causes a decrease. And that decrease will end up stabilizing here and it causes an increase and stabilizing there. That's negative feedback. So if it goes up, a negative feedback will cause it to come down. If it goes down too far, a negative feedback system will cause it to go in the opposite direction. Negative feedback is always in the opposite direction. And that whole process results in maintaining a stable environment. And if we have stability, we then have stable populations, which will make both the prey and the predator populations stable. Always remember that the food here for the predator is going to be your prey. So this food will be the prey. And the food for the prey is going to be the grass and the environment. But the minute this carrying capacity is, goes beyond the process, so it is surpassed, then we end up with environmental resistance. So the carrying capacity is harmed by surpassing it, in other words, going above it, the immediate result will be environmental resistance. And that environmental resistance will then cause a decrease in population numbers. And we end up then with regulation. And that regulation is going to be naturally. Okay, so it will be a natural regulation. And the minute we impact it as human beings and we, we um, end up interfering with nature, we end, the, the whole process is impacted and we don't realize what kind of impact we have because we immediately take away the naturally reg regulating process that, for example, a predator has on a prey population and also the regulation that the prey has on the predator population. Because remember, the predators rely on the prey. If the prey isn't there, the predator population will die. People, that in a nutshell is what you need to know here. Our next session, we go on to the different types of competition. Intra, remember, is always inside that specific population or species. And inter is between different species within a specific environment. But we'll get to all of that. And remember, us as human beings, we're messing up this, this whole earth. We need to start looking after our planet. We need to start conserving. We need to stop interfering with nature. We need to make sure that we don't mess up our trees because they photosynthesize. We can't impact on the water masses in the world, which is 70.8% of our total area on this planet is covered by water. 
in that water we have algae and it's that algae that is also photosynthesizing and providing us with oxygen. Without oxygen, we are dead. Without water, we are dead. Without land to plant food for all these incredible populations that we have, we are dead. We need to start conserv conserving and conserving in a really, really, really stringent and, and positive manner. Um, and you need to get involved. You really do. So there you go. That's, it's, it's from, that's all from me this week. Um, I should be wearing green. Maybe next time I'll wear a green hat. Okay, have a good one, study hard, and please learn your terms and definitions and your diagrams. Okay, remember what you put in is what you are going to get out at the end of the day. So have a good one, until next time.